Goeie dag, my liewe broers en sisters in ons liewe Jesus Christus. It is so good to be worshiping with you today. Um, we would love to be doing this in person, but we know that we will be able to do that again soon, and we really can't wait for that time. I would like to welcome any people who are here for the first time today. Um, like, subscribe, I don't think those things count for our channel, but we're just so glad that you are here, and we hope that you have a blessed time with us. Please contact the church office if you would like to find out more about our church. Um, we have a website that is full of information, ebcsa.org.za, where you can even bring your offering and your tithing in this time. Um, so if you would like to do so, please also just have a look at the website where you'll see that information. And then there's a further cool technology, prayer cards, where on the website you can go and complete a prayer card and our pastors will pray for you for whatever the need for, whether you would like to praise the Lord for something amazing that's happened or you're really desperate and need someone to help you pray for something. You can do so and the pastors will gladly pray for you. On to the announcements. Um, Pastor Promise is an urgent need for jackets and jerseys for both genders and of all ages to help in our community. Donations can be dropped off at the church office weekdays between 9 and 12 in the morning. And then Hidden Treasure is also running low on donation items. If you have any items in your home that cannot be used anymore by yourself, but can be used by others, kitchenware, linen, cutlery, crockery, clothes, containers, DVDs, CDs, books, anything, please consider donating it to the Hidden Treasure Shop. They use the funds that they raise to assist Tabitha House. Donations can be taken directly to the shop next to the De Bacare in Van Riebeck Avenue. And then an update on the call committee. I know it's been a few weeks since you heard that we have uh, reconstituted a call committee to find our next senior pastor. And we thank you for all your prayers. We've been spending a lot of time in prayer and consideration. And we are now progressing to the stage where we are accepting applications and we are considering candidates. So please do keep us in prayer. Um, we know that the Lord knows who the next senior pastor of this church will be. And we trust him that he will send that person our way. And we trust him that he will give the wisdom and the insight that will be necessary for that. But be, please do keep all of us in prayer. Let's close our eyes in prayer. Lord, this is such a difficult time for so many people in our congregation, in our community. But we know that you are forever above all of it. We know that everything is in your hand, that we are in your hand, and that we are safe there. And that we know that you know so much more than us. But we ask that you be with all those who are scared, who are sick, who are in pain, and we ask that you please just help bring healing, bring comfort, bring peace and joy as only you can give. Lord, we ask that you be with the members of the core committee. That they can have open ears and listen to your voice and know exactly who you are calling. Please be with every single person who is joining us for the service this morning. Work in their hearts, be with them. Be with us all. Your children are far apart, but we're always close together with you. We praise your name, dear Lord. Amen. Enjoy the sermon and see you next week. Good morning, church, and welcome. It's different being here without you, but we really hope that you are staying safe. We are thinking of you, and we are just so happy that we get to be with you in this way. And I really pray... We as a worship team really pray that this set would be a real encouragement to you as it's been to us. The songs that we're going to sing are true of God. It's to remind us who he is, where our strength comes from, where our hope comes from. It's him. He's constant and his promises are sure. Let's sing this together.
worship His holy name. Sing like never before. Oh, my soul, I'll worship Your holy name. The sun comes up. It's a It's time to sing your song again Whatever may pass and whatever lies before me Then we be singing when the evening comes So bless the Lord, oh my soul Oh my 
Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength, my song. This cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest droughts and storm. What heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are still. My all in all Here in the love of Christ I'll stand In Christ alone Who took on flesh Fullness of God in helpless pain This gift of love and righteousness No scheme of man could ever pluck us from your hand. We stand here only in your power. We live this life only because you are strong and able and capable. And we thank you for all that you are. We really pray now, Lord Jesus, that you would speak to us as we hear your word, that you would change our hearts, that you would remind us anew of who you are. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, good morning, church, and uh, welcome back to another version of Online Church. Uh, once again, I love recording in the sanctuary because I can look at the seats, and because we're a Baptist church, I know where each of you would be sitting anyway, so it's as if you were here with us. Um, so just know that I still feel like I'm preaching to you, even though I can't necessarily see you right now. Um, and what a joy it is to be bringing God's Word to, to our family, even if it means it has to be online just for this short period. 
Um, and as we start today, I just want to reflect on how great kids are. Um, I don't have any of my own yet, but I'm very excited for the day that God gifts us with, with kids, if that is his will for us. And they're just so great. They're born as blank canvases who come into this world with the potential to become absolutely anything. We see newborn babies, and, and aside from being captivated with their cuteness and perhaps even somewhat terrified by their frailty, we are always filled with a sense of awe at what they could become one day. We all do it. I mean, we notice small mannerisms in kids and then force on them the idea that because they have this mannerism, they must become this thing one day, right? So, so I know someone who's pregnant at the moment and her baby's kicking a lot. And so everyone's already telling her that her child's going to be a drummer or a runner. <laughs> um, I also know a young man who says some very strange things that always make us laugh. And so we're convinced that he's going to become a comedian. Uh, we have children who will play with a stick that we bought for them, and then we'll somehow say, oh, they're probably going to be a doctor, even though we're the ones who put the stethoscope in their hands. What about those of us who have children who love to argue with us? And the only way that we can keep our sanity in the midst of those arguments is to hope and pray that that child will become a lawyer so that somehow these, these meaningful, meaningless squabbles will all be worth it later on. Um, and despite the endless possibilities of what our, our incredible children will become one day and the, the joyful ignorance that we have about God's ordained future for, it, for, for them, there is one thing that I know for a fact every single child will become. Without doubt, every single child will become a mirror to its parents. Every single child will become a mirror to its parents. You see, children become mirrors to our own sinfulness and our own brokenness and our own hypocrisy. If you don't believe that something that you do is a sin, I guarantee you when your child does it back to you, you will immediately acknowledge that it was sinful. And this happens in many ways, some of them hilarious. You see, I always used to make fun of my mom, like she would come home and I would click at her as a joke and say, make me some tea or, or go and make me food. And then my dad would try and yell at me. And as he's yelling at me, my small, gentle voice would say, but dad, you made that joke yesterday. <laughs> and so he can't be frustrated with me because I'm just copying what he does. Or, or maybe, and I saw this happen very recently, I'm not going to mention any names, but there was a young man who had eaten a chocolate that he wasn't supposed to and was getting shouted at by his mom. And then he reminded his mom of how she last week had eaten a chocolate she wasn't supposed to and then told, her uh, told the kid's dad that she didn't know where the chocolate was. Ooh, so is this actually the child's fault? You see, it happens to all of us. I'm convinced that my child is going to make some very sarcastic, very rude statements that I'm not going to be allowed to be upset with them with because that will be my fault. But when it's not hilarious, it really should be a humbling and sobering experience which God uses powerfully to convict us of our sinfulness and our brokenness and calling us into repentance. You see, if you have a, a male child in your house who, who la lazes around on the couch all day, barking orders to his mother, not helping clean up, not helping with the dishes, not helping with anything, you see, we as dads would need to look at ourselves and wonder where they learned that from. If we have a child who lies to get what they want or lies to get out of situations or, or lies to benefit themselves, we need to ask ourselves where did they learn that from? If we have a child who struggles with anger issues, we need to stop and ask, is this child living in a home where anger is modeled as the most effective way to communicate or express ourselves? Children are models. They are mirrors which reflect back to us our very sinfulness and our very brokenness. And, and I believe that we need to look at today's scripture kind of as a child a child that's going to mirror back to us our own sinfulness and our own brokenness, a child that's going to mirror back to us our fallenness and our brokenness, calling us hopefully into sobering repentance before the Lord, saying, God, thank you so much for mirroring to me, for revealing to me where I'm falling short of your glory and committing to move forward in a way that follows in Jesus' footsteps down the narrow path. And I pray that we will see that this morning. 
So if you, if you have your Bibles with you, if you have your phones with you, open to Acts chapter 23. We're going to be reading verses 1 to 11 today. And as you open up, I'm just going to summarize where we find ourselves in the book of Acts. You see, Paul has now completed his three great missionary journeys and aware of the persecution, pain, and potential death that's awaiting him, he returns to Jerusalem where the prophecies and warnings of of his friends and his companions and of the Holy Spirit does not waste any time coming to fruition. See, as Paul enters into Jerusalem, he's met by a horde of angry Jews who attack him savagely and beat him, accusing him of heresy and accusing him of bringing a Gentile into a temple, which would have been an absolute scandal in Paul's day. You see, this beating becomes so severe that the Roman army has to come in, the Roman tribunal has to come in and rescue Paul from his own people. And Paul is then thrown in jail for his protection. How crazy is that? The safest place for Paul is in a Roman jail so that his very own people don't kill him. Wow, that must be a very painful and terrible experience for Paul. But now, obviously, the Romans want to figure out what's going on because they want to bring peace back to, their, back to their land. And so what they decide is we're going to scourge Paul, which is when you take a whip and you whip him, and then there's little pieces of bone in the whip that grab onto the skin, and they were going to, like, scourging's hectic. And so they say, in order to get the truth from what's happening here, we need to scourge Paul. But as they're about to do that, Paul reminds them that he is a Roman citizen, which means that it's actually unlawful for him to be scourged without a trial. In fact, it even means that the fact that they put him in jail without a trial was unlawful. So now these Roman, these Roman soldiers are, are in a bit of trouble. They're in a, in a sticky situation. And so they decide, let us go and let's convene a meeting of the Sanhedrin with the Jews. I'm going to release Paul to the Jews, and they need to figure this out. And that is where we pick up in Acts chapter 23. So let's read the word of the Lord together. And looking intently at the council, this is the Sanhedrin, Paul said, Brothers, I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up to this day. And the high priest Ananias commanded those who stood by him to strike him on the mouth. Then Paul said to him, God is going to strike you, you whitewashed wall. Are you sitting to judge me according to the law? And yet contrary to the law, you order me to be struck? Those who stood by said, would you revile God's high priest? And Paul said, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest. For it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. Now, when Paul perceived that one part were Sadducees and the other Pharisees, he cried out in the council, Brothers, I am a Pharisee, a son of Pharisees. It is with respect to the hope and the resurrection of the dead that I am on trial. And when he had said this, a dissension arose between the Pharisees and the Sadducees, and the assembly was divided. For the Sadducees say that there is no resurrection, nor angel, nor spirit, but the Pharisees acknowledge them all. Then a great clamor arose, and some of the scribes of the, uh, some of the, scribes of the Pharisee party stood up and contended sharply, We find nothing wrong in this man. What if a spirit or an angel spoke to him? And when the dissension became violent, the tribune, the Roman tribune, afraid that Paul would be torn to pieces by them, commanded the soldiers to go down and take him away from among them by force and bring him into the barracks. The following night, the Lord stood by him and said, Take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. And so Paul has now been placed in front of the Sanhedrin. And this meeting would have been called out of nowhere by the Roman soldiers. So we need to understand that the people of the Sanhedrin would have been in a bad mood already because this meeting has been called not by a Jew, but by a Roman official. And so they would have already been frustrated. As you guys all know, when a meeting is called out of nowhere, it messes with your schedule. It's very frustrating. So Paul now is standing, bef- uh, is standing before a group of people who already hate him and want him dead and are now angry because a meeting has been called against their will. 
And he begins his defense with a confounding and incredibly curious statement. You see, Paul says, I have lived before God in all good conscience up until this day. I have lived my life before God in all good conscience up until this day. What a bold thing to say. I mean, we need to remember that this is a man who assented to and aided and abetted in the murder of Stephen. This is a man who persecuted those believing in Christ, violently persecuted them, and participated in and engaged in actions which led to the murder of innocent people. So how could a man who has overseen the death of people, who has persecuted and hurt people, and has participated in actions which led to people's murder, stand and say that I have lived my life before God in all conscience, in all good conscience up until this day? You see, what we need to grasp from what is happening in this very curious statement here is that what we need in order to be righteous is not a good conscience, but a transformed conscience. What we need in order to be righteous is not a good conscience, but a transformed conscience. You see, we need to understand that a good conscience is simply one who lives their life in alignment with what their conscience deems to be good. And so when Paul persecuted the church, he did so in alignment with what his conscience felt led to do. He felt absolutely and totally justified in putting to death those who he deemed to be heretics. He, he felt justified in putting to death those who stood against Jewish law and, cu and custom. He, he felt justified in putting to death those who blasphemed against his God by claiming that this human Jesus was God. And heresy was a capital sin. And thus Paul would have felt clear and good in his conscience to punish those who engaged in blasphemy. Can you think of a time where you felt totally and absolutely justified in doing something. This is the right thing to do. Only a couple of weeks, months, or years later to realize that your conscience had betrayed you. And despite the fact that you felt like you were doing the right thing, you realized what you actually did was wrong. You see, I think we do this all the time. One of the main examples of how we do this is gossip. Man, are we good at gossiping in the church. And man, do we feel justified in doing so. We sit in small groups and we talk about the sins of others because we need to hold people accountable, right? We can't just sweep sin under the carpet. We can't just act like sin's not happening. So it's okay for you and I to sit here and talk about a person's sin who's not actually in the room. We feel justified in it despite the fact that we're not speaking to that person face to face. So this is not accountability. It is pure gossip. How about when we don't give to someone who's in need, despite the Bible's constant calls to generosity? We make excuses like, oh, I really need to pay for this this month, or I don't really have the money for this right now. When we know we probably could give, but we just need to be a bit safe. And so we feel justified in being wise with our money when actually God has called us to be generous. Or how about self-righteously judging someone and being unloving to them? Sometimes we feel totally justified in being cruel to people because they have sinned grievously. Now, I know that we all feel like it's okay to to call someone out on their sin, and it is. We must keep each other accountable. We must make sure that each of us are traversing the narrow path of righteousness, and that if there is any erring, we need to love one another by calling one another to remaining on the righteous path. But that needs to be done in love. But what we as Christians tend to do is speak down to people who are in sin, as if we ourselves are not also in sin. We exclude those who have committed sins that we deem to be too grievous to exist in our righteous communion. The truth is none of us belong in this place. 
None of us belong in the presence of Jesus. All of us deserve an eternity in hell because of the sin that we have committed. And so we cannot be justified in excluding or or self-righteously judging other people as if we are in some way better than them. You see, this term conscience is used multiple times by Paul in his letters. And the way that he uses it communicates that he means that our conscience, now I need you guys to stick with me here. It's going to be a little bit technical, but it's going to have a great payoff in the end. So conscience is the way in which a moral standard is applied to our lives, okay? So our conscience represents the way in which a moral standard, an objective moral standard is applied in the way that we live, but it is not the moral standard itself, okay? So so maybe let me give you a picture to help you understand what I'm saying here. Let us think of a stage light, okay? You get a stage light, and generally all stage lights are yellow, all right? It's the color that you're seeing shine on me now very brightly. It's yellow, and it, it, it's just there to light up the stage. But sometimes what will happen is the light will be covered by a film, which will be, um, you know, whatever color you can think of, red, blue, green. And all of a sudden, that yellow light is applied to the stage as green or blue or red. I want you to think right now of the light as the objective moral standard that God has set for the world. We must all remember that all humans, Christian or non-Christian, have the law of God engraved on our hearts. And so there's this yellow light of objective moral truth. But what ends up happening is we place a film in front of that, which is affected by our upbringing, our insecurities, our experiences, and our values. And that film is what applies the light to the stage of our lives. And our conscience represents that film. Our conscience affects the color of the the light that shines on to the earth. And so in 1 Timothy 4 verses 4, we read this, the Spirit expressly says that in later times some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons through the insincerity of liars whose consciences are seared, right? So another word for seared could be branded. So I want you to think about this film, and I brand a picture of a dog onto the film and then put it over the light. And now when the light shines onto the stage, you see a dog. Does that make sense? I hope you're following along with me. That is what happens with sin. Sin brands our conscience, and sin colors our conscience and distorts and changes the beautiful bright light of Jesus to be something that is completely different. It is a red film placed over the the light of God's moral objective, and it causes us to shine red on the earth. You see, if we are to be holy and righteous, our seared conscience needs to be replaced with a brand new conscience, which is clear and simply allows the light of Christ to shine in unobstructed glory through us onto the stage of life. What we need is just a clear, transparent, see-through piece of paper placed in front of this light so that what people see is merely the yellow, glorious, transcendent, beautiful light of God that is not colored by anything other than its pure majesty and glory. And so when Paul met Jesus face to face and saw his glory, his beauty and his transcendent majesty, the scales were removed from his eyes. The film was removed from his conscience and he was given a new heart and a new spirit, which also transformed and renewed his conscience so that his life would now be orientated around coloring the world with the true color of Christ. We read in Ezekiel 36 verse 26, I will give you a new heart and a new spirit and I will put within you, I will remove the heart of stone from your flesh and give you a heart of flesh. You see, we have been given a brand new heart with brand new desires and along with that brand new heart, we've been given a transformed conscience. You see, we do not just need good consciences. Because living in alignment with our conscience, while that might be a good thing to do, is still evil if you have an evil conscience. 
And so we need to be trusting in Christ to transform us, renew us, and change us. And this is why the statement angers Ananias so much. So we read that after Paul says he's lived in good conscience, Ananias has him struck. And by struck, the Greek word actually means like punched in the face really hard. Why is Ananias so upset here? Well, you see, Paul used to be one of them, right? Paul used to be a Pharisee. Paul used to be a walking and living validation of the Pharisaical structure, Paul believed that priests, teachers, and scribes like Ananias had all the power in Jewish community and were the ultimate gauge of what is right and what is wrong and could exert judgment over all Jews with impunity. You see, Paul validated the pharisaical structure which saw the sick and the lowly as sinful, unworthy, unclean, and, and, and worthy of dishonor, and priests as being perfect and beautiful and, and, and righteous who should be getting all of the power because of their external righteousness. However, his new consciousness undermines all of that. His new consciousness sees him believing that the law is powerless to save and that observing the law does not save someone for, for sin or uh, does not save someone from sin or qualify them for honor. His new con consciousness sees the Pharisees as white washed tombs. His new consciousness sees Jesus as the ultimate high priest who made a way for all people who put their faith in Christ to be priests who have direct access to the presence of God through the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Whether they are born Jews or born Gentiles, Christ unites all of us under his banner, giving us direct access to his presence, calling us his people, one people under one God, united by one spirit for one mission, which is to glorify glorify and make much of him in every way. And this is an absolute affront to Ananias and all that he benefits from. Ananias was described by Josephus, who was the famous Jewish historian, as one of the most corrupt and vile high priests in history. And the reason why he could remain a high priest whilst being corrupt and vile is because he was able to cover up his corruption with the veneer of external goodness. See, I want to ask you guys, has your transformation since you came to met Jesus sometimes gotten you in trouble with the people who you once spent your time with? You see, because we are new people, it doesn't mean we stop spending time with the people who we knew before we got saved, but it must mean that we cannot see eye to eye on everything that we used to. I want to ask you, are you standing for Christ in a way that might anger the people who you used to connect with before you got saved? Has your transformation in Christ placed you in positions where people you knew before and agreed with before would be frustrated and confounded by your newfound commitment to Christ? Our transformation must be an affront to those who do not yet know Jesus. Our new moral standard must be an affront to people who don't know Jesus. It must be because we are different from the world. And we must sometimes come up against the world as we stand for the righteousness of Christ. Once this is done, we see Paul confront Ananias for his hypocrisy. You see, follow, following being struck on the mouth or punched in the mouth, Paul responds with a sharp and terrifying accusation. He calls Ananias a whitewashed wall. You see, the only things that were whitewashed in this time and in this Jewish culture were tombs. You see, this harkens back to Jesus' claim in Matthew 23, verse 27, where he refers to the Pharisees as whitewashed tombs, which are beautiful and presentable and clean and wonderful on the outside, but are filled with dead man's bones on the inside. Filled with dead man's bones on the inside. You see, Ananias was respected as the high priest because of his external good works. He observed the law. He did everything that the Jewish law told him to do. And so as a result, people were like, man, this guy is perfect. But the truth is, when he had Paul struck, which was against the law, it revealed that his heart was corrupt. It revealed that he indeed was a tomb carrying around dead man's bones. It revealed that his heart was filled with rage and jealousy and insecurity a heart more concerned with power than integrity. 
a heart more concerned for external good works and human fame than true and genuine relationship with Jesus Christ. A heart more concerned with personal glory than glory to the God who is worthy of it. And then it's brought to Paul's attention. Hey, why would you speak to the high priest like that? Would you, would you revile the high priest? You see, what would be happening here is that because this meeting was called impromptu and because they weren't given time to prepare for it and because it wasn't an official meeting of the Sanhedrin, the priest would not have been wearing his official priestly garments. And because Paul hadn't been in Jerusalem for over 20 years at this point, he wouldn't have known who the high priest was. And so Paul does not know that the person who he's saying this to is the high priest. And so he apologizes. He apologizes. He says, I did not know, brothers, that he was the high priest. For it is written, you shall not speak evil of a ruler of your people. And so Paul shows humility in apologizing for, for disrespecting the position of Ananias. But there is a very interesting thing that's exposed here. Paul does not recognize Ananias because he's not wearing his uniform. Paul does not recognize Ananias as the high priest because Ananias is not wearing his uniform. And the truth is, that Paul should have recognized Ananias as the high priest, not by his uniform, but by his conduct. Not by his uniform, but by his conduct. And the truth is that we as Christians do have a uniform. Brothers and sisters, please hear me on this. You and I do have a uniform that we must wear every moment of every day. Isaiah 61 verse 10, He has clothed me, with garments of salvation and has wrapped me with a robe of righteousness. We do have a uniform, brothers and sisters, and this is a uniform that we are to adorn every moment of every day. We have been wrapped in righteousness. Now I want to ask you, do people in your life recognize you by the uniform that you wear? Do the people in your life know that you follow Christ without knowing that you attend church or call yourself a Christian? Do they recognize you because you wear your uniform of righteousness with pride? Are you living a life that is so characterized by righteous obedience, kindness, generosity, and love that those who encounter you will be left with no doubt that you have received the transformative power of the Holy Spirit? Are you dressing yourself in your uniform every day, the uniform of righteousness? This is how the world will know that we have been saved by Jesus Christ, not by wearing a cross around your neck, not by wearing a what would Jesus do bracelet, but by living righteously and living like Christ. You see, Paul shows that he is robed in righteousness by showing the humility and repentance needed and apologizing to Ananias, even though Ananias was wrong to have him struck. Paul exemplifies what someone who is alive in Christ looks like in contrast to someone who simply seeks to look externally beautiful whilst at the same time carrying around dead man's bones. Church, are you alive on the inside or are you simply trying to paint the wall of your soul's grave with futile good works? Are you alive on the inside or are you simply trying to paint the walls of your soul's grave with futile good works? Do you love Jesus? Do you desire for his name to be made famous in your life, even at your own expense? Do you desire to see his glory, even if it means you not being glorified, even especially when it means you not being glorified? Are you captivated, captivated by his majesty, or are there other things in the world which are more beautiful to you than Jesus? Are you in awe of his love and kindness to you? You see, it is a heart that is captivated by the love of Jesus, captivated by his majesty and his glory, that desires for his name to be made famous. That is a heart 
of an alive Christian. If you come to church every week and serve faithfully every week and go to Bible studies, but on the inside there's no love for Christ and no desire for him to be glorified, there is a chance that you might also be a whitewashed tomb in need of the Spirit of Jesus. And finally, Paul shows us that a house divided cannot stand. A house divided cannot stand. You see, Paul perceived that in this group of the Sanhedrin, there were some Sadducees and some Pharisees. And because he used to be a part of this group, he knew that the Sadducees did not believe in the resurrection, that they did not believe in angels or spirits. And he knew that the Pharisees did believe in the resurrections, that they did believe in angels and spirits, and that this was a huge source of contention within the Sanhedrin. And so Paul, with one statement, tears them apart. He says, I am actually on trial here because I believe in the resurrection. And now the Pharisees say this really funny thing. Remember the, the Pharisees wanted him dead not so long ago? The Pharisees now say, oh, I see no wrong with this man. I see no wrong with this man. Even though five minutes ago I wanted him dead, now I realized he agrees with me. And so you know what? He's fine. Let's keep him alive. The fickleness of the human heart can always be revealed in the things that we hold dear to. You see, the Pharisees felt that their doctrinal beliefs were more important than their relationships with other people. They felt like their doctrinal beliefs were more important than justice. I mean, think about what Paul's being accused of here. Paul's being accused of heresy, capital sin, and he's being accused of bringing a Gentile into the temple. That would have been means to be put to death at this time. And, and that should have been what was the most important thing in this trial. But instead of focusing on justice, they're now focusing more on this petty doctrinal squabble between them. And Paul's able to expose that with one statement. The truth is a house divided cannot stand. A house divided cannot stand. And what we need to identify, church, is that unity is not our default. We have been taught from the moment that we are born that if anyone disagrees with us, that if anyone is different from us, that if anyone is other from us, that they are not one of us. We have been taught from the moment we're born, speak to the people who agree with you. Love the people who agree with you. And if people disagree with you, disregard them. That is not the kind of unity that we've been called to in the church. Yes, there will be disagreements. And yes, there should be debate about those disagreements. But we need to seek such a strong unity and love amongst us that no disagreement could ever be strong enough to divide us in the way that we have seen between the Pharisees and the Sadducees. We need to be so connected and united around the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ and the glory of his name and making famous his name that nothing, no disagreement could be strong enough to tear us apart from each other because we are held together not by our common beliefs or our common understanding. We are held together by the blood of Jesus. And if you are letting things separate you from one another, we are in sin. So church, let us be a church who fights for unity. If there is a current disagreement that you're having with someone, if there is a fight that you're having with someone, if there's someone who you haven't spoken to, if there's a family member or a church member or a friend who you haven't spoken to because of a disagreement, call them today. Zoom call them, do what you need to do. But a house united, a house divided cannot stand. A house divided cannot stand. And the truth is, church, we're seeing this all over the world, that division in the church will be the downfall of the church. And so let us hold to our common joy and our common belief in Jesus Christ. Let us commit to loving one another, even when we disagree, even when we hurt each other, and be united in always seeking reconciliation. Be united in always seeking forgiveness and be united in always seeking to love one another. 
And finally, Paul, who has now been abused by the, the high priest, who has been beaten by the high priest, who has been face-to-face uh, -face with an unjust high priest, comes face-to-face -face with the ultimate high priest. The following night, the Lord stood by him and said, and take courage, for as you have testified to the facts about me in Jerusalem, so you must testify also in Rome. You see, Jesus is the true high priest who, rather than inflicting undue punishment on innocent people in a breach of the holy law of God, actually took punishment onto his innocent body for the law of God to be fulfilled and the mercy of God to flow like a river. Jesus is the ultimate high priest who himself became the sacrifice for sin, going to the cross to die on our behalf so that our hypocrisy, so that our, our tendency towards division and all the sin that separates us from God could be put to death and we could be declared holy and righteous and blameless in the eyes of God and given a brand new identity. And Jesus then encourages him with his presence and his word. What's beautiful about our high priest is that we read in Hebrews 4 verse 15 that we have a high priest who is able to sympathize with our weaknesses, who has in every respect been tempted as we are, yet without sin. You see, Jesus was also on trial for something he did not do. Jesus was also an innocent man who was placed on trial. And unlike Paul, Jesus was ultimately crucified and killed. Jesus knows what Paul is going through. And Jesus knows, your high priest knows what you are going through. So as we go into a time of praise and worship now, let us be face to face with our high priest who is perfectly just and perfectly merciful and who knows exactly what you're going through. Remember, Jesus has been rejected as well. Jesus has been hurt as well. Jesus also didn't have a home. Jesus also was, was rejected by his friends and betrayed by his friends. Jesus knows exactly what you are going through right now. And let's just revel in his presence, our great and wonderful high priest. Have a wonderful week. Love you guys.
Lord Jesus, blessed be your name. Blessed be your glorious name. Help us, Lord Jesus, with this thing, this thing of, of remembering who you are in the good times and in the bad times. Help us to help us to remember who we are in our identity in you in the good times and in the bad times. And to and to help us to trust you, Lord Jesus. Be with us this week. Amen. Have a blessed week, everybody. See you soon.